We leave the level of neuro neuroscience and ascend up to the level of cognitive psychology uh, because when you're trying to give a, a theory of what a mental state is when it's conscious, what, the, what you're doing here is asking what is the difference between subliminally perceiving something and superliminally perceiving it. One is conscious, the other one is not. Um, the, the subliminal perception has all of the causal um, uh, influences and mechanisms that the conscious one does. In fact, I was recently just reading a paper which suggest, which showed that, uh, or strongly suggested, that uh, commercials that are unconsciously perceived, so they're on the background that you're not conscious of them, um, that they are more effective than ones that you're conscious of or that are consciously paying attention to. So the unconscious states have a strong have strong causal connections and so on. So now there, and, and there are basically two theories of this uh, kind of stuff. So you distinguish between what we call a first order theory and a higher order theory. So the first order theories um, claim that conscious mental states are ones that you're conscious with. So when you're seeing an apple, you have a mental state that represents that there's an apple there, and that's what a conscious mental state is. It's representing the features of the objects out there. Now the problem with this from the higher order view is it seems to make every conscious mental state, every mental state a conscious mental state, and it's, we seem to lose the distinction between conscious and unconscious mental states. Which leads us to the higher order view. Now on a higher order view, Conscious states are states that I am conscious of myself as having. So um, if I have a belief that George Bush is the worst president in the history of the United States, that can be an unconscious belief and it may be influencing me in various ways. Um, but of course I can have that belief consciously and when I do, I'm aware of myself as believing that. So I'm conscious of the belief itself and there, then the belief is a conscious belief. So we have these two various theories, and interestingly, um, some empirical work has been brought to bear here. Uh, and so I want to take one look at an argument, which is supposed to be an argument in favor of the first order view. And it's going to be a good primer for us, because we're going to come back to this uh, when I want to look at a, a more recent argument. This one's um, a few years old. I want to look at a more recent one. This one will, uh, having have this, will help us. So here's a figure from a paper by Fernandez Duque and Thornton, and what they're trying to show is that um, you can detect that something has changed even if you don't consciously detect that that thing has changed. So here in the in figure A you see the experimental design. So you're presented with these rectangles arranged in um, a clock-like formation around a central fixation point, um, and then you're presented with that, and then a mask, and then another one um, where they're exactly the same except for one of the rectangles has changed its orientation. So I've just labeled those George and not George. It'll be convenient for us to do that. So George is the um, uh, horizontal one, not George is the vertical one. So you present them that, each one 250 milliseconds, first scene, mask 250 milliseconds, second scene. Then you present them with C, where not George is highlighted, and you say, did this rectangle change its orientation? Subjects can't tell, they don't know. Um, they're not aware of it. Well, in fact, they're, they're wrong. It has changed. So they, this is sort of your classic change blindness scenario. Now, in fig, the interesting thing that is in figure B, if you say you highlight both of these diagonal ones and say, well, if you had to guess, if you, if you were told one of these two changed, which one would you pick? Well, subjects pick not George, um, which seems to suggest that they have the information there. We're going to come back to that later. But right now, let's just focus on figure C. So Fred Dretzky famously argued that this change blindness result poses a problem for higher order views. So he says, look, he reasons as follows. They, they, subjects are presented with C, the figure in C, and they have time to observe it. They're conscious of every part of the, um, there's plenty of time for them to observe it. So they have a conscious experience of all of the rectangles but they're not conscious of the difference. So they have a conscious experience, the experience um, of all the rectangles and they had, um, but they're not conscious of this experience. And so therefore higher order views have a problem.
Now, David Rosenthal has responded to this in various places, and what he says is that um, there's a problem here. The argument doesn't show what it's, what it's alleged to show because one can have a conscious experience of not George, even though one's higher order awareness doesn't represent not George as the difference. So you have a conscious experience of the rectangle in a certain orientation, you have a conscious, so you have a conscious experience of not George. You have a conscious experience of George, right, the previous one, but you're not conscious of not George in the respect of it being the difference between the two figures. Therefore, it will seem to you that there is no difference between the two scenes. But it's, so we can sort of explain what's going on here, but it's not the case that there's an conscious experience that you are not conscious of. So there's nothing that falsifies or threatens higher order theories in change blindness. Now what about phenomenal consciousness? That's of course the uh, um, big problem. But according to the higher order theory, if, if it's right, one of its main big virtues is that it's going to allow us an explanation of what phenomenal consciousness is. And, and in, in such a way that we can see a straightforwardly naturalistic accounting for um, phenomenal consciousness. So according to the higher order theory, for me to have a conscious pain is just for me to be conscious of myself uh, as being in pain. So here I am. Now suppose I you know, have this pain. Um, this is a mental state here and that says pain star there to represent that it's different from um, the pain property that I'm sensing. So if, for instance, you've stabbed my leg with a knife, there's going to be tissue damage and nociceptors are going to be sending me a signal. Um, and that's the thing that I'm sensing, the damage there. Um, and the pain star then is going to be the state that in my mental life has the causal connections um, associated with that kind of pain. So it's going to cause wincing and screaming and running around and so on. But if the pain, yeah, it, <clears throat> like all mental states, can occur consciously or unconsciously, then we need to explain what it is for it to be conscious. Now, according to Rosenthal and according to the higher order view, when the pain is unconscious, it's not painful for you, even though it may have certain causal connections. You won't experience it as painful until um, you have a higher order awareness of it in Rosenthal's case of thought. Now, of course, in, in the case of pains, they usually directly cause their higher order thought, so it's rarely the case that pains are unconscious in this way, but it does happen occasionally. You have a headache through the course of the day, you're not aware of at some points. Um, let, you might be thinking about something else, and then suddenly you notice the headache again. You know, oh, there's that headache. And it seems like it's the same headache, it's just that at one point you weren't aware of it, you weren't conscious of it. Um, okay, so now that's nice, as I said previously, because it's going to give us this naturalistic reductive account and if transitive consciousness can be straightforwardly explained in terms of neural synchrony then <clears throat> it's going to turn out that we can give a non-mysterious account of phenomenal properties because my having a conscious pain it just turns out to be my being transitively conscious of myself as being in a certain state